office over there yeah. and we talked about Jackson and Jackson's funeral and I was at the time before there was a Jackson Center I was thought I the, the most important thing that ever happened at Jamestown was Jackson's funeral all eight justices showed up here yeah that's unbelievable and that's it was 54 so that was kind of becoming dusty memory so I interviewed all of your contemporaries at the time 22 years ago about that one day you know this is this is Charlie Price Sam Price Booty Wayne yeah. Herrick you know Phil Erickson you name it and yeah. you were you were part of that and what I forgot because uh, that during that interview was there was a very long interview I just posted it a couple of weeks ago you know I was just focusing in on Jackson for the movie and YouTube and stuff but we went on for like an hour uh, so you know you were you have stories I know you have stories I'm gonna start with this because I just pulled this up and you may never have seen this this is a census the census of 1940 yeah that's out there and it talks about Willard Cass Jr. At the time, this 1940 census. Yeah. You were nine years old. Yeah. So you were born uh, 1931. Right. I was born in 1930. 1930. I got it wrong here. Uh, and talk a little bit about your mom and dad. Well, <laughs> my father. Of course, I had the same name, uh, Willard. And my mother, interesting enough, was named Florence. And she was a Venman from Frewsburg. Mm -hmm. And uh, her f father was Milton Venman. And he went to Allegheny College no and played baseball at Allegheny played third base, and I have a picture somewhere at home of all those players at that time. Wow. And uh, he's the one that got me interested in baseball and hunting and fishing because I was the uh, only grandson. He had, he had two daughters, my mother and her twin sister, Janet. Janet went to Cornell. My wife went to Fred my mother went to Fredonia, and uh, so uh, they didn't have any boys. So when I came along, he took me under his wing and taught me baseball. He used to pitch to me, taught me how to bunt. And he said, that's very important. In those days, they did a lot more bunning than they do today. Yeah, yeah. So. That's fascinating. And your dad, was he was, all, he was a lawyer, obviously, Willard Kiss yes. Sr. And where did he go to law school? My dad went to Albany Law School, and he graduated 31 days before I did. I went to Albany Law School also. And my son, Stephen, graduated 31 days after I did. Years. Years? Yeah. <laughs> 31 years, yeah. That's amazing. Now, as I recall, as you told the story earlier, that not only your dad went to Albany, but so did your, this would be your, your dad's brother, your uncle Alan went there You're as well. Right. He was, he was the first county attorney here in Chautauqua County. Oh, is that right? Yeah, and uh, is there a, is there a uh, an Alan Cass Robert Jackson story in all of this? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I'm just curious, curious about that. I think you may, may uh, talked about it at some point. That may be more Steve's story than than than, than yours. Um, so your dad was a lawyer, and was he always destined to come back to Frewsburg and to practice law? Well, my dad came back, and he uh, practiced in Jamestown, okay. in the Hotel Jamestown. And I used to go up there and see him, 
and they had a, a barber in the basement of the Hotel Jamestown. And uh, he, he took me in there and got my hair cut every so often. And it was a very interesting place. So your dad, what kind of practice did he have? Was it a general practice? Yes, he had a big general practice. And uh, then, uh, and he always smoked Lucky Strikes. Okay. <laughs> but he quit smoking. His, hand, his fingers from the nicotine was all yellow. Right. But uh, he quit smoking about 1948. Okay. And he never smoked after. And it probably gave him a few more years of his life. He didn't die until 72. So as uh, you were growing up in uh, Frewsburg, uh, why did your mom and dad decide Frewsburg was a hometown? <laughs> well, we had the hotel there. Oh, did you? Yeah, and uh, my grandfather, he had the insurance on the hotel. Milton Venman was an insurance agent. And uh, so when I'd go down there and see him, I sometimes He'd take me over there, and I'd have a hamburger usually. And he'd have one beer. He said, I only ever have one. And <laughs> he said, that you never should have more than one. I, and so he, was, he taught me a few things like that. Well, uh, so we, part of the process of growing up as a kid there, baseball was a big part of your world there. Oh, yeah. And uh, did you get a chance to, uh, uh, so they had local teams there in, J in Frewsburg? Yes, they did. We had a team in, in Frewsburg, and all the towns around had teams. And uh, it was Frewsburg baseball. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, I used to go up there and watch them when I was a kid. And I used to play catch with them. And when I got in high school, they needed a player. They asked me to play with them. Mm. So I started playing with them in high school and all these older men. <laughs> and I, but I was the shortstop and, uh, and it was very interesting playing with them. Hod, Hod Nelson was a pitcher and Lyle Nelson was the manager. Okay. Yeah. And Frank, uh, Frank Walker was a catcher. Frank played for, for Falconer, and he also played for Frewsburg. So. Well, the, always the best player was the shortstop. So clearly you were recruited with somebody who had a good arm and I'm sure a good bat. <laughs> yeah. So what if, I mean, you're here, you are the young kid. Uh, is this the kind of week, did you play on weekends or was this all week after schools? Well, we just played on, usually that, that town team only played on weekends. Mm -hmm. But uh, then later on, I started playing, I played with the Fenton Lumber Company I played with Marlon Rockwell, and uh, Charlie Goodell was the catcher. Oh, really? And I was the shortstop. We played up at Chautauqua. We were the Chautauqua team, and uh, so. What kind of ball player was Charlie? What? What kind of ball player was Charlie Goodell? Charlie was a very good ball player. Yeah, he was a good hitter and he was a good catcher. And a good Republican. Yes, he was. <laughs> yeah. Well, just, uh, I'll ask the question, was, did, when did, was your dad a Republican? Was this something that was, no. you grew up in? Yes, no, it, all of our family were Republicans, and uh, they were all active in the town, usually. Mm -hmm. And both of my grandfathers, were town justices, 
in the town of Carroll. And uh, my father was never a town justice, but I was. Yeah. And my son was. A long tradition, long tradition. Uh, so not only did you play baseball during the summer, but you probably had other odd jobs as well. Uh, Steve was talking about picking beans and working at Carnation. Talk about those days. Yeah. I, uh, I worked for Glenn Sheldon, and he was a truck farmer. And uh, I'd go up there early in the morning, and uh, he'd say, okay, boys, we're going to give them hell today. And, <laughs> and uh, I, I just say, okay, how much corn do you want? He said, 300 dozen. You know, that's an awful lot of corn. We'd start at seven o'clock, and, and we were hand picking them. Yeah, we hand picked three hundred dozen ears. We'd put five dozen in a bag, and he, he brought them up here and took them to the stores and places and sold them. Thank God. Yeah, but my first uh, job was uh, uh, getting the cows, and that was for John Stoddard. John Stoddard had a farm, milk farm, and uh, he was also the, he plowed the, the streets for Frewsburg, and he had a, an old, an old, it was a, a, a the uh, uh, bumpers on that, uh, that plow was wood, yeah. and uh, this old horse would just f go right along, and he'd follow it along with that plow. Well, he gave me 50 cents a week, and uh, I had to go up on the hill behind this farm and pick up the cows and bring them down so that he could milk them. And then uh, later on, he gave me a job and I was working for him. And then I ended up over on Glen Sheldon. And then they had the pea vinery in Frewsburg. And the pea vinery was the place to work because- uh, Wait a minute, stop that. Pea vinery. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, what is it? Well, that's where the farmers would grow the peas. Right. And uh, the uh, owner was a Fuller Cannery Company in South Dayton. And they'd send someone to each farm and when they were just ripe, you had to pick them because if they got any bigger, they weren't as good. Yeah. And so we had a conveyor belt down the middle. Well, the farmers would bring them in and dump them on the ground. And we had to shovel them up on the conveyor and they go up through this machine with a lot of paddles. And the paddles would hit them and the peas would bounce out, and they'd go down into a little yeah. conveyor, and then they'd go in and we'd box them up, and they all went down to Heinz down in War down in uh, Pittsburgh. Yeah. No so, kidding. Now that's a new one. I mean. And uh, <laughs> I got paid. All right. Perfect. I got paid one year. I was getting 60 cents an hour, and I worked 100 hours, and I got a check at the end of that week for $60. <laughs> so I was, well, really, that time, that was, I was really pleased. Yeah, holy cow. And then you also worked at Carnation at some point? Yeah, they had uh, uh, the... Uh, it wasn't Carnation, it was uh, Borden's. Borden's, yeah, yeah. 
And Borden's had a milk plant in Frewsburg and all the places around had milk plants like in Borden's had a place in Randolph. But uh, I went to work for Borden's and uh, I used to dump the milk and then I used to have to clean the machine. The milk, they made powdered milk. And the way they made powdered milk, they had a great big round tube, wasn't quite as big as this room, but it was round and it was all steel lined. And uh, the milk would be shoot into that thing and it would just go right into powder. And uh, after the, they did that, you'd have to go down into the top. You had got in from the top and you had climbed down in there. And I'll tell you, if you had claustrophobia, <laughs> you wouldn't like being in there. I wasn't happy being down there, but I was in there and I did it every time. Well, the guy that I worked with, a guy by the name of Gordon Barton, he couldn't go down in there. He was so afraid. <laughs> but I went down, cleaned it off, so that was part of the job. So there was no idle time for Bill Cass no, in Frisberg. No, there wasn't. No, I, I really enjoyed working. So you not only enjoyed working, but also obviously when you had spare time, you were playing baseball. Yeah. D does that, did you have a chance to get and see other, like go to Cleveland anytime? Did anybody take you there to see professional games uh, as part of just growing up? Well, I played basketball in high school. Right. And uh, one time I was playing up at, we played all the local town. One time I was playing up in uh, Chautauqua. And uh, at the halftime, I had 30 points. Whoa. And which in those days, in 1948, that was a lot of points. And I would have broken the record for the county, which I think was 36 then. And uh, <laughs> I got thrown out on fouls, on five fouls. And they were wrong about it because I only had four, but they had marked it wrong somebody else. But that, that, I was thrown out. But uh, I like to play basketball. It was a good ball game. Well, it was a great thing to do off season when you weren't playing baseball. Yeah. Just uh, when you played not only basketball, baseball, did you ever play any other sports as well? Well, I played football one year, but uh, I didn't play the whole year. When I graduated in 1948, I went down to Falconer to play bay, to play football. Nick Fedorka was our high school baseball coach and basketball coach, and he thought I would be pretty good playing football, and I would have enjoyed playing. So I went down there to play for him and he said, then I'll get you, I'll get you into college. Play for me for one year and I'll get you into college. I said, that's good, okay. So I played down there and uh, for about, oh, well, we started in August and it was in about the middle of September when I went to college. I went out to Michigan State, and uh, that was a, that happened, it just ha so it happened, it worked out. My dad was a good friend of John Yockum's, mm -hmm. 
and uh, they used to play poker together and they were friends and they used to go out to dinner together at the town club and and uh, John said what's Bill doing now I said to my dad and he said he's down in Faulkner taking a postgraduate course he said he should be in college he said I told him that but uh, he, where he's not in college said, well, why don't you do something about it then? And he said, all right, I will. So he called me and he said, you know, you should be in college. I said, probably you're right. He said, I got a working agreement with the University of Michigan and Michigan State University and you can go to either one of those schools right now. Well, I would have to register late, but uh, I said, okay. Well, Robin Roberts yeah. just graduated. And uh, there were other ba baseball players that made the major leagues coming out of Michigan State, and my sister was at the University of Michigan. So she was one year ahead of me, and she was the valedictorian of the high school class, and I wasn't, I was just a B student or something like that, I don't know. And uh, <clears throat> so I didn't want to go to Michigan where my sister was. So I went to Michigan State, and that's how I happened to go. Well, I'd be remiss if I were talk. while we're on Michigan State, you actually are part of the history, the lore of Michigan State. Yeah. yeah. Isn't there a trophy that has somehow you have a part of? Yes. <clears throat> I, I became a vice president of the class of, of 19, uh, I was a junior. And uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Gene McDermott, he became, he was going to run for president. He said, why don't you run for vice president? I said, what's a vice president do? He, <laughs> he said, he doesn't do anything. I said, okay, I'll run. <laughs> and so uh, we both ran and we were both elected. Well. One time we were at a bar and uh, at that time Michigan and Minnesota had, a, had the old, the little brown jug. Yeah. And he said, you know, we should have something like that between Michigan State and one of the other universities that they play. I said, that, yeah, that'd be good. Well, in this bar, there was a, a old brass spittoon. And we thought, you know, that's what we ought to use. We can use the old brass spittoon. So we went to the University of Indiana and uh, talked to some of the students there and they got it approved by the university and we got it approved by Michigan State. And so the old brass platoon now is, is you can see it on TV every yeah, time yeah. they play Indiana. <laughs> and uh, one time a few years ago, I was invited out to see the, uh, see the team play and Gene McDermott was there and uh, the ball game, I don't know who we were playing, but Kirk Cousins yeah. was a quarterback for Michigan State and he's now uh, with uh, I think with the Vikings. Vikings. Yeah. yeah, so it was kind of interesting because they took us right down on the field 
and uh, and very very interesting to be down there with those players. Well, being the originator of the old brass platoon is greater than getting a Heisman Award. This is great, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you, uh, we'll get back to some of this stuff, but you graduate from Michigan State University. Yes. And when does the Korea War kick in, and does that? All right, well, when you go to a land-grant college like Michigan State, you had to take ROTC mm -hmm. two years. So I took two years ROTC, and then they said that uh, you could take uh, advanced ROTC and get a commission, but uh, it didn't have to. You just had to take the two first two years. So I decided that I was going to become an officer if I was going into service. So I I decided I'd go in the infantry and. Uh, a good Jewish friend of mine said, the infantry, you want to get killed? I said, what do they do? I said, well, they do the fighting. And uh, I, he said, quartermaster is what you want. I said, what's a quartermaster do? Well, they handle uh, provisions. They take care of the ammunition, they fish, furnish the ammunition up to the line and they do things like that, and uh, so I switched and became a quartermaster, so when I graduated, I got a commission as a quartermaster, and I graduated in June uh, 52, and the Korean War was on, mm -hmm. and uh, I was called into the service on July 20th, 1952. And then, uh, what did you do your boot camp? Did you have boot camp because you were a commissioned officer? Did I what? Uh, boot camp. Was there a boot camp then at the time? Or did, when you went in uh, and, as a commissioned officer, Yes. Uh, where were you assigned first? All right, I was sent down to Camp Atterbury, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And that was a wonderful place because uh, the New York Yankees had a, that was my team, and they had a farm team in Indianapolis. Ah. And so I used to go down there, it was about 30 minutes away. I used to go and see the ball games there Moose Scourin was one of the players that played for, for them, and uh, they all got a chance to play with the Yankees. So it was a good place, and I, I was there until, uh, till the f December when I went home, and uh, I got shipped overseas. To Korea? You were shipped to Korea? Yes. Yep. I got married on a three-day pass. And uh, then... Well, let's pause for a second. All right. Uh, you got married. You obviously got married to somebody. Tell me about her. All right. I married Florence Gustafson. And she was a local girl in Frewsburg. She was a cheerleader. That was before Title IX, so the girls didn't play sports much. And, uh, but uh, she and I started going together in 1948. And so in 1952, we, we got married. I was out of the, I was in the service and and uh, she came was home, she was and she was at Fredonia College, and uh, so but I was a graduate, so uh, I got shipped out. So uh, quite the honeymoon, three days, huh? 
that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> then you're shipped out. Um, uh, and then you end up in Korea. Uh, what, what was your assignment in Korea? What, what, was, your, what was your job there? All right. I, I, was in, I was sent to Japan, hmm. and I went uh, through chemical, biological, and radiological school for two weeks at Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima is not too far from Hiroshima. And uh, they, uh, yeah, we had to have gas masks and we had to be marked and they'd figure out how many Renkins you got in your body. And they, they put us through that school and told us that what we had to do. And then they, um, we went to Sasebo, Japan. And from Sasebo, we took the boat out of Sasebo over to Pusan. Mm -hmm. And Pusan was in the end of the, was in the perimeter. And, and then I got on the train there, and I was sent up to Seoul. And they put me in the, the a laundry com company. It was in the combat zone because uh, we had to wash all, the, all of the clothes that came back from uh, from the men that were up on the line, which was about 30 yards, 30 miles away. And uh, so that was my job. Did you have much interaction with the, the frontline guys? You know, not only did you get their uniforms, but did you have a chance to talk about their experiences on the front line? No, I did not. Yeah. I had to go up there I had to take arm ammunition up there. That was dangerous. And uh, that was the only contact. You had to take it up and get out of there as fast as you can. When there was downtime in, in Korea, did you guys uh, do hunting or play baseball or do anything yes. recreational? Yeah, after the war was over, I got over there in April of uh, 1953, mm -hmm. and the war ended on June 27, 1953. Mm -hmm. So I was there for part of the war. And uh, when the war ended, the uh, different outfits uh, started playing baseball. So <laughs> I sent and got my glove and uh, spikes <laughs> and we had uniforms and everything and uh, it was wonderful playing playing ball but uh, when you go through Sewell was really badly shot up and uh, and when you take a look at some of the buildings and today in Ukraine, you get an idea mm -hmm. what happened to Seoul. Because uh, the Chinese had come down through. First the North Koreans came down through. Then they were driven back by the Americans and then the Chinese came down through. So. It had been worked over pretty good. And, and while you were there, and I guess because you were a commissioned officer, uh, you got involved in the judiciary proceedings. Yes. There. Tell me about that. All right, well, you, in the, in the service, there's three time, kinds of court martial. There's general. And that's for somebody committed like murder, arson, rape, serious felony. And then there's uh, 
special court martial, and that's a lesser court martial. And then there's one by the, by the company commander, and that's a summary court martial. Well, when people are assigned to a summary court martial, they're still entitled to have someone represent them. And so I got appointed as a defense counsel hmm. for some of these people. And uh, I won a couple of cases and then they made me a prosecutor. <laughs> and you know, they were things like sleeping on guard duty or disobeying an officer's order or some things like that. Weren't, they weren't really serious, but you could, you could get some time out of it. Now you had not been to law school at that time, right? You just come out of a... Yeah, that's when I decided, when I got in those, when I got involved, I had no intention of, of becoming a lawyer. I thought, that's crazy. I was going to be in phys ed. And uh, so, <laughs> they, uh, I wrote to my father and I said, I'd like to go to law school when I get back out. And uh, would you send me some books? Ah. So he did. Sent me a couple of books. And I studied those. And, and then when I got back, I, I uh, asked my dad, what do I have to do to get into law school? He said, well, you've got to file an application. And uh, so I did. And one of the things you had to have was uh, you had to be recommended by an attorney. So I said, who should I go see? And my dad said, go see Al Olson. So I went up to see Al Olson. Al said, well, I guess I'll have to sign it. Your dad signed mine. <laughs> <laughs> so he signed the letter of recommendation. And uh, Robert H. Jackson signed Steve, Stein, my dad's. Wow. So. Great connect. So. The aha moment for you to become a lawyer was in Korea. Yeah. Wow. What a neat story. Yeah. Uh, and your dad sends you books in Korea. You now yeah. can understand and, and yeah. be a prosecutor, defense counsel prosecutor, and then off to law school. And as I understand it, you weren't the only person from Chautauqua County who went to Albany Law School. Did a guy like Ledestro, did you catch up with him there too? Yes, I did. He was a good friend of mine. And uh, we played baseball with each other and basketball. And he, was, he played for Falconer. He was a shortstop for Falconer. Oh, was really? he? And uh, so, and then... Uh, we had both worked for the county, so he, uh, when I showed up in Albany the first day, he, I saw him there. I said, what are you doing here? He said, same thing you are, what do you think? <laughs> and so he, had, he went to St. Bonaventure and uh, graduated from St. Bonaventure. Now at that time you probably brought um, Floss Cass with you too. Yes, we did. And she, he probably had Emily out there also. Well, he, he, Lucian wasn't married. Okay. I was married and Floss taught school. And uh, I had the, Lucian and I each had the GI Bill, $115 a month. And uh, so, yeah, and Floss had a job 
she she got twenty seven thousand dollars for the first year. No, no, not twenty seven thousand. Twenty seven hundred probably. Right. Okay. So it's a rounding error. It's okay. I'm not sure what she made, but it wasn't very much. So there you are. Um, did you and Lucian hang out together while you were in Albany? Yes, we did. Like what? What would you do? We hunted and fished together. We used to go up to the Adirondacks and fish the Aw Sable River. It was only about th three hours away. And I had a Nash car and Floss made some, it made into a bed and Floss made some curtains for the, uh, for the windows and we slept in the car for a couple of days and then we then we usually go and rent a motel for a day so get cleaned up but uh, uh, when Lucian finally got married why Emily came with Lucian and we'd go up there to the four of us and uh, have a good time together and drink a few beers. You're only supposed to have one. Is that what I was, didn't I learn that earlier? That was a story, but it didn't always work. You just did that in Allegheny too, right? One beer? Is that what I Hey, I digress. Uh, so you were in law school with Lucian and were you both destined to come back to Chautauqua County? Were you, was there any decision otherwise that you might go elsewhere? Or were you coming back here? I was coming back with my dad. Right. So, and Lucian was trying to get a job. Now Lucian being uh, Italian and uh, not a lot of Italian lawyers, did you ever sense that he had, was there any sort of uh, difficulties he had just kind of landing with it, getting a job? Well, there was Tubi Scarpino and uh, and uh, Doug Spoto's dad, Ross, Ross, Ross Spoto. Spoto. Okay. And there was there were a few. Michael Lombardo. Michael yeah. Lombardo. Yeah, there yeah. were a few. Yeah. Not, not as many. So. Where was your first offices? Where Where did you come back and land? I uh, my first office was down in Frewsburg. Ah. And uh, my dad says, I'll pay you $25 a week. You aren't going to be worth it, but I will pay it. To, <laughs> I, Sherry Cadwell said the same thing to me. <laughs> I, I get it. And I was pregnant. Oh, <laughs> so. <laughs> that rings a bell. <laughs> yeah. So I went to work for him, and that worked out. And then. Uh, what happened was uh, Rockefeller got elected. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I was gonna, I decided, to, first of all, I was gonna live there and we are gonna buy a house and we bought a house, 15,000, I think it was. And, uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, we, uh, when Rockefeller was elected, they have a, in, in each county, there was a tax attorney oh, yeah. for the county. Yeah. And that appointment was made by the county chairman. The county chairman was Charlie Goodell. Oh, wow. And Charlie Goodell and I were very, very good friends. And so Charlie called me one day and he said, Bill, he said, I got this appointment that I can make. And uh, I know you're a young lawyer and I, I'd like to have you have it. I think we, we met at the town club. I said, what's it, what do they do? Well, you have to determine whether there's a tax on an estate. 
and you have to open the safe deposit boxes. Every time a person dies, they seal the box. I didn't know that, of course. So I said, yeah, I'd love to take it. And uh, that paid $5,000, which was a wonderful thing. But he said, you know, you gotta move to Jamestown. You can't be down in Frewsburg. You gotta, you gotta get an office in town so you can take care of everybody. I said, okay, I will, I'll move. So I started looking around for offices and I found Adolph Johnson. Oh, okay. And Adolph Johnson was where I went because uh, somebody had had the office next door to him. And uh, somebody by the name of Jude. Yep. And uh, so I had his office. And uh, we had one secretary. And uh, Adolf, he had a lot of, a lot of estates because he, uh, he uh, knew a lot of the Swedes. And uh, so it was a good office. It worked out fine. So that's really your chance to get exposed to not only uh, the community because people die and therefore they have to go and get their safety deposit boxes. That was normal. I mean, everybody had safety deposit boxes back then. And then working with Adolf kind of exposed you to the whole surrogate court type deals. I mean, it was just trying to think of the beginning of all this is sort of interesting. Oh, it was perfect. Yeah, so that that's great. So then. You were kind of in an office. Were you with Adolph or just sort of shared offices? Just shared the office. Just shared offices. We shared the secretary. Okay. And um, while you were building your practice, did, what, what sort of practices were you doing? General or did you find yourself? Uh, general. Yeah. I had a lot, of, uh, a lot of town justice stuff. Right. And... Uh, and career-wise, now that at some point uh, you're still active in the Republican Party, and uh, yeah, uh, well, talk about that. I decided there was an opening in Frewsburg for a supervisor and for town justice, and uh, so I wanted to be a town justice, so I ran for town justice. And uh, I ran against a fellow by the name of Wallace Fenton. And he became supervisor the following year. But uh, so that's what got you into this judicial, yeah, you know, politics thing. So I spent I spent twelve years as a town justice. And then in 1971, the surrogate's office, McKinley Phillips was the surrogate. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I ran for surrogate and got, uh, got uh, endorsement of all three parties. And... Uh, How did you do that then? I mean, to get the Democrats, well, for example... Well. See, a lot of people weren't really interested in that, how they do that, how they, how the judiciary ran, that uh, if you run in the judiciary, they can, uh, you can uh, run for any party and uh, you don't have to be endorsed. So I, I decided that I would run as a Republican and I'll run as a Democrat. And Lucian, <laughs> Lucian is my Democrat and I had to have the, him and several for fill out the vacancy 
So, Gerasi Gir- was the chairman for the Democratic Party. And he knew I had the petitions going as a Democrat. And they couldn't find anybody, I guess, to run. And he called me up one day and he said, Bill, said, we're going to endorse you. He said, you got any more of those petitions? I said, I got a lot of them. <laughs> he said, send, send some over to me, will you? Oh, I said, I certainly will. So I sent them over and he got me uh, the, the endorsement of the Democratic Party and then I was and I had the Republican Party and then, and then I got the Conservative Party. So, Did you ever, uh, you know, in, in uh, Chautauqua County there's, of course, county court, there's family court, surrogates court. Did you ever have any consideration of family court at all? Yes. I, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to be a judge and I really didn't care what, what uh, was the judge. So the family court judge was John Hollenbeck, but he wasn't at that time. There was a guy by the name of Palmer. And there was, and uh, so when he stepped down, it created a vacancy. So I decided I'm gonna run for that. So, I uh, got some people lined up and everything as you have to do. And uh, John Hollenbeck, he was uh, uh, very active in the family court over in Dunkirk. Mm -hmm. So he was going to run. And uh, so (laughs) it was going to be an appointment by the governor. So we had a had a a uh, it wasn't really a petition. It was a, it was a, the the committeemen all met in Mayville to decide who was going to be the candidate. And we all went up there and spoke at the courthouse. And uh, Hollenbeck won. And uh, the, uh, it worked out well because uh, <laughs> the Republican Party all said, all right, you'll get the next one. So the next one was surrogate. So that's how I became surrogate. And did you ever, I mean, I always remember you always running, always winning. Did you ever have any, did anybody ever run against you or did it, you cross endorsed every time? Yeah, they ran against me as town justice and lost. And uh, then when I retired and. 99, I, uh, they, town asked me, Stephen had the, was, uh, had to retire too for the appointment. Yeah. So they wanted me to be the town justice. Well, I said, I'll stay for the rest of the year but I probably won't do any more than that. So they appointed me as town justice and Bob Gray was the other town justice. And uh, we had a good relationship and so then they, they couldn't find anybody else to run. The Republicans couldn't. So I ran and at that time there was a uh, Democrat that ran against me and I beat him. So I, I had, uh, I had twice 
but it was townships, yeah, those towns. But it was a town justice. It wasn't in the county. No, you you were you were good. Um, you were the surrogate court judge then for gosh, almost did it 20, 28 years? Twenty? How many years? Seventy one to ninety nine. Did you? Uh, uh, you were there. I mean, it was almost thirty years, weren't you? A surrogate. Well, no. I uh, I would have been. I would have had to retire oh, at, at at seventy. At seventy. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And, uh, and so I uh, I left early so that the Republican governor could appoint could appoint a Republican. Yeah, he didn't do a bad job. Not a bad job, that Republican governor. <laughs> uh, I would be remiss in, uh, if I didn't ask you about one of your first hires as a, in fact, your first hire as a clerk uh, for, uh, as surrogate court. You hired a young attorney, uh, and he, you together with Judge Adams, who was a county court judge. Could you talk to me about that hire? <laughs> well, the first clerk that I ever had was your wife. <laughs> Tell me about her. I, 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 I've right. never had those questions asked. Well, <laughs> I knew that she was, she was in school, and uh, I knew that uh, she came in to see me, and I talked with her, and I said, well, I, I'd like to have you as a clerk. We don't have any funding for it. There's nobody uh, has ever been my clerk, and uh, so I'd just soon have you, but we can't pay anything. And your wife said, that doesn't matter. I'd just like to work for you. I said, that'd be wonderful. And uh, so she also talked to Lee Town Adams. So Lee Town Adams was going to have her too. And uh, we said, we'll see what we can do about getting this thing funded. So we went to Jurassi, who was a county chairman, and, and uh, he got a little money for her. Mm, I didn't know that, sir. Yeah. Well, she, that's, that was the highlight of her legal career, was working with both of you. Yeah. And, uh, you, and she, did, she did some uh, research and a, kind of a draft opinion writing. Was that, that her job? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, that's always been a highlight. Um, then at, at one point, um, did you get a chance to elevate yourself from surrogates court judge? Was there a chance at the federal level at all? No, there never was, but uh, our county judge was Rollin A. Fancher. Yeah. And Judge Fancher had to retire at age 70. So when he retired, he was a Supreme Court judge. He was county judge, but he became a Supreme Court judge. So he retired and uh, there would be an, an election for Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court's a little different than any other court because uh, any lawyer can run for a county judge or surrogate or as long as they've had the five years of experience, a few things like that. But uh, Supreme Court is nominated. So you have to get, the, get nominated to get your name on the ballot. Well, at that time, uh, I, wa I wanted, uh, I thought about becoming a Supreme Court judge. My dad wanted me to be a Supreme Court judge. And uh, so they, the county Republican Party would endorse me. They said that. They said, we're going to move you up to Supreme Court. 
I said, I don't know, I gotta think about that because in those days, the Supreme Court judge was assigned to Buffalo most of the time. And he was only down in Chautauqua County for the December term and the June term. And uh, so I, I was busy with my family and they were playing sports and I didn't want to miss any of that. And uh, so I said, I don't want the Supreme Court. So they, uh, they endorsed Ricotta and Ricotta uh, yeah, was, a, was a perfect deal because the Republicans got one, got Ricotta in and the Democrats got somebody else in. I know you love to watch and be part of your kids' world and, and of course sports and sports is so much part of your world. Uh, I gotta ask a couple of questions. When you were growing up, uh, did you have a chance to ever go to Cleveland to see your Yankees play? Was that a normal thing to do? I know a lot of people oh. would get on the train and get out of Cleveland. Not yeah. to see the Indians, but to see the Yankees. Yeah, I used to, my dad uh, took us out to Cleveland and we had, uh, they had what they called a trolley here. Uh -huh. And the trolley went from Jamestown to Westfield. And so you could get on the trolley and go to Westfield and then get on the train and go to Cleveland. So my dad took me in. We got on the trolley, we went to Westfield and then we went to Cleveland and watched the Cleveland and watched the Yankees play. And uh, <coughs> my grandfather, he, the Yankees w were gonna have a World Series in 1947. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, so they were gonna issue tickets, anybody could send in and maybe get tickets. My grandfather sent in, he got three tickets to all four games. Mm -hmm. uh, Yankees were the home team. So, I went, uh, I, I went with my grandfather and Lynn Benson from Frewsburg. Sure, absolutely, yeah. And the three of us, and we all stayed in Short Hills, New Jersey, where my mother's sister, my aunt, Janet, was there. And uh, we got on the train in the morning, and they, they get an orange, yeast orange, and they'd not, the conductor would all give all the places that we on the way into New York City. And uh, then we went to the games. So I saw the first and the second game, and then they moved the game to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm the Brooklyn Dodgers, and uh, <laughs> Jackie Robinson was playing for Brooklyn. Ooh, he was playing, and uh, so I w went to the first two games and then the other, the other three games, so they were tied up when they finished, there were th three games apiece. Now they're playing the final game, the seventh game of the World Series, Yankee Stadium. And my grandfather and I got there early and uh, we had the seats, they were a long ways away, but they were good, they were okay. And uh, it was a great ball game. I saw Joe, DiMaggio hit one and uh, it came right out our way and it came right down and Joe Gonfredo caught it and 
when DiMaggio, I watched him coming around the bases, and he got to second base and he kicked the dirt there. Very famous, yeah. Yeah, it's a very famous picture of him, and I've seen it several times. Well, and you were there. I was there. And the Yankees won. Yeah, and then after that was over, I walked down the field, I walked down to Monument Park, and saw, saw all those monuments out in the field. And there were other, lots of people down there. And one guy, a lot of people were getting his signature, this old fella. And I thought, I wonder who he is. My grandpa says, go up and get his signature. I said, okay. So I went up, and it was Tris Speaker. Tris Speaker. And I asked you one time, if you ever got his signature, you said, yeah, you had his. Well, he's huge. Certainly for uh, Cleveland Indian you know, fans, uh, Tris Speaker in yeah. Boston. Well, he played with Hugh Bedian. Yeah. Way back when. Uh, and did you ever get a chance, you know, in that time period, there were often barnstorming teams that would come through Warren and other Oh, areas. yeah. Did you ever get a chance to see that? Yeah, my grandfather used to take me. We used to go watch the Falcons play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw a lot of those games. And then the Homestead Grays used to come. They were down in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And they used to come up to Warren and play. And the Kansas City Royals were the best black team. But these, this Homestead Grays, they were very good. Yeah. And so I watched them play. I had a good chance to see that. that were they, did they play down at Betts Park? Is that where they played in Warren? Do you remember the name of the park at all? Uh, down I by don't, the river? It was uh, down there where they now have the United Refinery. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you've had an amazing career. Now, now I, I, forgot, I forgot to ask, everybody had a first case, a first legal experience. Oh, yeah. You must have had one. I did. Uh, so talk about it. All right. My dad said, uh, I've been saving this case for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I said, wow. What is it? He said, you got to sue the railroad. The railroad went through Frewsburg. And it was uh, part of the New York Central. And we had a station master down there. And I knew him. He lived right up the street from me. And uh, so my dad said, Go down and see Carl Rynell. The train killed some of his cows. And uh, the law is, is very firm. They, ha they have to keep the fences mended. And the fences aren't mended and aren't taken care of. And the cow gets killed, they're just liable. I said, okay, I'll go down and see him. So I went down. And he told me what he had, a couple of cows. I got to figure what they worth. And uh, so I uh, wrote a letter to the New York Central in Buffalo. Never got an answer. So then I decided, well, I got to sue it. Who do I sue? Well, you could sue the, you could serve the station master. The law was that way, so I served the station. I, oh, he was mad, and I did that. But just before the 20 days were up, I got a call from the attorney in Buffalo, from the big head of the company that represented the New York Central. And uh, I told him, I said, 
You know the law requires you to keep the fence mended and you haven't done that. I got pictures of that. And he said, we know. He said, how much you want? So I, well, let's get this thing settled. How much you want for those cows? Well, I said, they were Holstein cows. They were valuable milk cows. And we, so we fuss around with it. And finally agreed on $300 a piece. And so he said, okay, you get me a release and I'll send you a check. I said, all right. So I got the release signed. I sent it down to him and I got a check back. Good for you. And uh, my client was very happy. His son, Carl Rynell, had a son, Kermit, a cousin of mine, and Kermit was in Korea with me. And after the war was over, he was a hunter as I was, and there were lots of uh, pheasants over in Korea. They called Kwang, and uh, so Kermit and I decided to go hunt pheasants. And, uh, but you had to be careful because of mines. Mm -hmm. You had to go, uh, certain areas you had to be <laughs> really careful. But uh, we went out and we hunted over there. Had a good time. Well, speaking of hunting, I'd be remiss also if I didn't ask you about uh, visiting your uh, basement or your den. Uh, there are trophies uh, all over the place, including the, the Grand Slam. Uh, could you explain that? Because not everybody has that, would understand that, and let alone to know what it is. But that's an amazing achievement. Well, uh, they have what they call a Grand Slam of sheep. And that's a uh, doll sheep, which is found in Alaska. And then the stone sheep, which is found in uh, British Columbia. And then the uh, bighorn sheep down in uh, Colorado and uh, uh, Montana. And, and then there's the desert bighorn sheep found in uh, some of those states, but in, in uh, New Mexico and, and in uh, Mexico. So I was fortunate enough to shoot all four of those. And that's something you just don't, you gotta get a license? I mean, this is a, this is a process. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's a, in most places it's a draw. Hmm. And you have to, you you have to, with some states, have to have so many points to draw. And they, you get one point for every year you apply. And uh, I used to apply for all of those. And I applied for Stephen. <laughs> and Stephen got them all, so worked out well. Well, uh, what's remarkable in your family is the fact that your wife had not only supportive, but she often went with you on some, some of these trips. Yes, yeah, she did. And uh, <clears throat> my first time that I went to Africa, I went with uh, Ray Nelson from Jamestown. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't have any women along, just Ray and I. And uh, we bought a, Ray bought a 458 Winchester rifle. And we went down to the Faulkner Rod and Gun Club to sight it in. And I sighted it in. And uh, I said, you want to shoot it, Ray? And he, Ray shot it. And he dislocated his shoulder so he couldn't hunt. But he said, I'm going anyway, because I, I just like to hear the stories and see the animals. And so he went, but I did all the shooting. And that worked out real well for me. 
I, I've been given a note here that at one point with your wife, you were out in a, uh, uh, a hunt and uh, you ran across a lion and the lion decided to come visit you. Yeah. Talk about that. All right, well, that was the second time that I went to Korea. My wife went along with me. And uh, she went with everything. She was very good, good walker. And so we uh, baited for lions. We put up a big bait and uh, the lions came up, we came up the next morning and we found the lion tracks. And uh, he said, there's one of them's a male, there's a lot of females, and a whole pride. And uh, so we started following them. Well, it was quite a long ways. And then they, uh, the tracker came back he said, they're right up ahead, they're taking a nap. They're all laying down. So that's a good time to get up there and get them. So, Floss stayed back and uh, not too far, but just back a little ways. And I went with a guide up and so he pointed out the male and he said, uh, I'm going to shoot if you don't uh, kill him and if you wound him or anything. I, I said, that's all right. So we're laying there watching and I'm going to wait until he probably stands up so I can get a good shot. And all at once uh, he shot and he hit the lion in the leg and the lion jumped up and roared and took off. And all these lions were running everywhere. There were so many of them. There were about 10 or 12, maybe even more. And uh, he got up and he said, come on, we got to get him. <laughs> so we were running after the male. And uh, He's roaring. He's, he really is something. <laughs> and uh, so the uh, lion is finally stopped and saw us coming and turned around. And he looked at us and he roared. And then he started coming right at us. And he was going about as fast as he could with three legs. And uh, I shot him and finished him off. But that... Uh, How fast was your heart pumping at that point? Uh, what? How fast was your heart pumping at that point? I don't know. I, I really... And Floss... Floss saw these lions and uh, she said that uh, <laughs> that uh, she asked, why didn't you? She asked one of the guides, where are you, go where are you going? He said, well, he said, I'm looking for a tree <laughs> or something. Well, well, he said, I could see that the he ran, toward he the ran right <laughs> toward the lion. And now I'm out here alone yeah. in this riverbed. And so I ran behind him as fast as I could go, right toward the lions. And the, the lion roared. And I mean, your <laughs> heart's bumping, and you don't know what's going to happen next. It was, it was very exciting. And then they'll shot it. But we're out in the middle of nowhere with the lions running all over the place. It was a whole lot of lions. Wow. Well, didn't you ask him something? Probably would have said. How come he ran after the lion? Yeah. He said, I, I could see that he saw a native. He said there was a native between the lion and me and I knew he'd eat him first. Uh. 
Wow, what an experience. I what? Yeah. <laughs> what an experience. My golly. <laughs> So uh, before we have one last thing to do, Judge, before we let you go, uh, we're going to look at that composite and just you can tell me some war stories. But also, uh, is there a question, Floss, I should be asking him that uh, as we went through a lot of this kind of overview, but is there uh, uh, something you'd say, hmm, Greg, we should get this on tape? Probably seeing the like thing that I have mentioned before about this practice of women. It, it's been an exciting time. Yeah. Life. Well, they, as you, as you, ref, yeah, we can talk about that maybe when we get wrapped this up here. So I'm going to show you the 1967. This is 67. So this is probably the far back as I go that you're on. You're in it. Uh, and as you look at some of those na people, many of them, I were a kid if I met them at all, but. If you've got a war story or a vignette or something comes to mind, you know, just let me well, know. All right. I noticed that uh, three judges up on top were Fancher and Lester Berglund and McKinley Phillips. Well, Lester Berglund was a city court judge here in Jamestown, and I had a... he handled a lot of misdemeanors and traffic infractions. And I had a lot of those cases. So I went before him many times. And he, he didn't like anybody that would be causing some problems like a trial. And uh, so he gave Lucian and I bad times. Probably gave every young lawyer a bad time, I don't know. But uh, I remember him well. <laughs> and uh, he, he was okay. And when I became surrogate, he had a lot of estates, so he was a very good friend. <laughs> The worm had turned. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. How about some of these other guys that are pictured there uh, that come to mind? Well, there was uh, Toby Scarpino. Uh, Toby uh, was an interesting guy. He. Uh, he had a camp out near Panama, mm -hmm. and he invited Ernie Leet, another older lawyer, and I and Lucian to come out and have a couple of beers and talk over the old times, I guess. And so we went out there to his camp and had a good time. Mm -hmm. And Ernie Lee had a, a place here in Jamestown. And Ernie Lee uh, had a, a built a, a sauna. A sauna? A sauna is right. Yeah. And he and he invited me up, and so we went in there and had a sauna, and he, he got all hot up, and it was cold outside. <laughs> then you stepped outside, and it got cold. But Ernie was a nice fella. Lyle Heimbaugh's on there. Lyle Heimbaugh's on there, yeah. What? Lyle Heimbaugh. Oh, yeah. Lyle. Lyle's office was just down the hall from me. I was in 400 in the Wellman building, and uh, he was with, he was in with Spoto. Douglas hadn't come back yet from... Douglas went to Duke, uh, Duquesne, 
and uh, Lyle and I became very good friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. Did he actually practice law, or was he more? I know I always remembered him later on as kind of the railroad. I mean, he kind of whether he owned part of the railroad, or I'm not sure what it was, but. Well, he owned part of the railroad. Yeah. And uh, he invited us to come over there one time, and we did. You remember that? To the railroad? To yeah. Gowanda or something? Yeah. Oh, we did, you're right. We did. We went to Gowanda then. And we took the three children. And the, their two boys. And uh, rode the train. Right, yeah. we did. That was fun. But, uh, and Lyle had a big boat. And the boat was, I don't know how many feet it was, but he, uh, he also had a canoe that he had a lawsuit w over the canoe. And uh, John Selstrom, I think, had the, he owned that same canoe for a while, but it was uh, one that they used up on Chautauqua Lake. Did he have a ticker tape in his office for stocks? What? Do you know, Lyle? A ticker tape. Do you remember whether he, Lyle had a ticker tape? I knew he, he was into the stocks. I mean, I don't really remember much him practicing law. Oh, he was a character. No. He, he went over to Good Body and Company, uh, which was the predecessor for Phillips. And uh, they were over in uh, Hotel Jamestown. No. Yeah. And uh, he'd go over there every noon, watch the stock market. And Lyle was worth some money. And Lyle met this Jewish woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, we became friends with them. And we used to go out on their boat together. And they used to come down to our house in my wife would always make a pie and Lyle <laughs> Lyle would always get a couple of pieces and she Floss would send some of it home. We'd hide it in the trunk of his car. It was a little game we played. Yeah. What were some of the other lawyers? Now give me, I, I must ask, because I ask everybody, give me your best Howard Crosley story. Howard Crosley. Everybody's got a Howard Crosley story. Well, I, <laughs> Howard was a very good lawyer. And uh, when I was a town justice, he came down to Frewsburg and uh, represented some of the people that came before me. And uh, I remember one case that I had that uh, mm. Howard represented the defendant and uh, pleaded him not guilty. And uh, it worked out uh, we worked out a compromise and the fellow paid a fine and that was the end of it. And that's about the only thing that I ever had with Howard Crosley. Well, let me tell you I'll, a personal story because there were several. While we were waiting <coughs> in the Hotel Jamestown to go visit you as a surrogate court. And of course there was Autumn Sl Slater was there. And all the attorneys would gather, we just gather, you know, hoping against hope that we'd deliver the papers and they, there may be a need for a guardian ad litem. That was the bonus for us, you know. Occasionally you were kind enough and they needed somebody right there and right there to say, get these, you, you, I don't know what was being said, but say, get, this, get young, some young guy to come in, sign some papers and get a hundred bucks. I mean, I mean, that's the thing. But 
What was important was Howard Crosley would often be there while we're waiting, because you went in one at a time. And Howard would hold court. And he was a professional actor. I mean, he was unbelievable. So we, as young attorneys, would love to come to your court for two reasons. One, hoping that we might get something as a guardian ad litem. But most importantly, Howard would be there. Because he was, I think, I don't know where his offices were, but he yeah. would always be there. He was a very active in the little theater in Jamestown. Yeah. And I saw him many times uh, on display. <laughs> he, he played well. We had a laugh. I mean, he was just gregarious. Just, just Howard Crosby. Yeah. I know an interesting story. Uh, back when Dad was practicing law, do you remember when you used to uh, send the people to Mexico to get divorced? Yes. Oh. Yeah. We used to. I thought it was Nevada. Yeah. Have you heard this whole story? No. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, <coughs> in those days, the only grounds for divorce in New York was adultery. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of people, you couldn't prove that anyway, so uh, we used to send them to either Las Vegas mm -hmm. or Mexico. Well, it worked out and we could send them to Mexico and they could do it right away. If you went to Las Vegas, they had to stay there for six weeks and that was too long, most people couldn't afford that. So, but Mexico, I had a lawyer come into my office one day and he was from down there. And he said, you send them down to me and I'll take care of them. And I said, what are you gonna, what are you gonna charge? And he told me, I don't know what, it was three, four hundred dollars. And uh, I used to send them down to him. And he took care of them. Didn't they have big party trains or planes that went down there? They had a big party. They put them on a big plane and send them down there and have a party for the weekend. Everybody get divorced and come back. <laughs> Do you remember that, Dan? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, this is a little lot. So here you've been, Judge, I mean, literally from Korea when you got you first dabbled in law to really Today, I mean, here we are in 2022. Do, do you get a sense of what the law has meant to you and the family and, you know, the, the practice, kind of a legacy type thing? Well, it's been a wonderful thing. It's, it's, uh, I grew up in, with my father practicing law and then I practiced myself and my son was practicing, so it's it's just been a wonderful life for me. And uh, I got a wonderful wife and family, and uh, I'm still living in the same town that I was when I got back from law school and where I grew up and played basketball and baseball. So it was very good been very good to me. Well, you are the second most important lawyer to ever come out of Cruzburg, <laughs> New York. I just, that's, that's important. Yeah. Good luck, Steve. You aren't going to get any higher. Yeah. So this is great. Any, any other questions I should have asked you that I forgot, Steve? Did I miss something? By the way, he did a nice job on outlining this stuff. Just, you know, there's, he could go through every one of these lawyers and tell stories about Sherry Cadwell, Dalton Burgett, Bob Booty, right, Al Ford, Phil Erickson, Alton Erickson. Yeah. I mean, lots of stories. Remember Skip? Well, I knew them all, of course. <laughs> well, I was, was going to say his, his grandfather, I think both grandfathers were town supervisors? Was Milton a town supervisor in Fruzburg? No, he was a town justice. Okay, how about Allen? Allen, were either, either he, of the Allens town justices? Allen was a town justice and he was also the supervisor. Okay. And when he was the supervisor, 
uh, Elliot Kidder was a supervisor for Kind Tone. Uh, yeah. And so the two of them were very good friends. And they got together and uh, they got the rest of the supervisors to appoint Alan Cass, my dad's brother, a county attorney. So that's the first county attorney we ever had, right? Yeah. Well, Dad, when when yeah. you went to work with Al Olson, was it Grandpa Cass said go up and see him? How did you decide on Al Olson? What do you mean? How did I decide? My dad told me go see him. Okay, there. <laughs> Your dad probably told you a thing or two, right? Well, at some point, Judge, uh, was Hartley part of your world? Lynn yes. Yeah. Lynn Hartley was a uh, he was uh, going to law school at Syracuse, mm -hmm. and he was looking for a job in the summer, so he came to see me. And I gave him a job in the summer, and he worked for me for a couple of months. Okay. And then he, he, I, he said, uh, can I come back when I graduate? I said, yeah, I'll give you a job, come back. So when he came back, he came back and worked with me, and Lynn. then he saw, he saw, <laughs> How I became a judge and he became a judge. Family court judge, yeah. 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 Lynn's aunt Peggy was married to George Matthews. Ah. And they were good friends of ours. So George Matthews, yeah. Right, George yeah. and Peggy. We yeah. spent a lot, of, a lot of laughing evenings together, <laughs> having a good time. You know, another interesting side note, Uncle Raleigh. Yeah. Um, Uncle so Raleigh was a classmate of Robert H. Jackson, hmm. and they were very good friends. And, uh, and they played a lot of tricks together. Would you tell a story with, uh, two stories with Uncle Rowley? One, Bill Reading. You remember that story where they were sliding, sled riding down Uncle Rowley's oh, garage? Bill Reed. Bill Reed. Right. Do you know Bill Reed? Yeah. You remember when he was playing on Uncle Raleigh's garage? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> he said that uh, they used to, he lived up 23 Woodworth Avenue, mm -hmm. and uh, the boys would come down, and uh, there was a lot of snow, and they, would get up on the roof and they'd jump on the snow. And uh, my uncle said, Bill Reed, he was in one of the guys that used to jump on the roof and that. And, uh, and my uncle took his camera out and took your pictures. And then he told him, now I've got your picture and you, if you ever come back again and climb on my roof, I will go to the police and I know who you are because I got it right here. And they never came back. <laughs> well, that's effective. Yeah. But Uncle Riley also set up Allegheny State Park. No kidding. Yeah. Tell that story. Yeah. Well, that was before they built the, the pond there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they used to have a, quite a place down there. We used to get down there as kids and they'd have animals. They used to have a bear. Did you ever go down there and see the bear? No. They used to have a bear and they used to have some coons and some different animals. And uh, my Uncle Raleigh was there, and uh, when they 
planned the pond, planned uh, the lake. And uh, so when I get down there, I think of that. I think of my uncle sitting up on that side bill where the administration building yeah, was. Yeah. And that's where they met and planned the lake. And now it's all it's quite, beautiful. A, quite a nice place. Well, they just had their 100th uh, celebration. And we, I interviewed a couple of folks, including Dobby Bergen, who was a commissioner, uh, on, the, on the history of it all. So I didn't appreciate now, until now, uh, your uncle's connection to all that. Wow. That is great. Um, well, you are a tribute to our Bar Association, Judge. And we're so glad that, um, well, I haven't asked, the one most pivotal question is, I've told the story a hundred times about the Jackson Center. And I've told the story about how we, the Jackson Center, got started in 2000, 2001. Yeah. And a conversation that Betty Lene and Carl Kappa and myself and uh, Tom Carbon from the Gebby talking about trying to just get started and that it was uh, Stan Weeks, Stan Weeks who called me and said, Greg, if you're ever interested in doing something special for Jackson, you should consider the consistory, the Scottish Rite consistory. And the farthest thing from my mind was that. So I went up and met with Bill Winchester, Bill Winchester, yeah, Bill, uh, Carl Winchester, Carlton Winchester, Carlton Winchester. Yeah. They had the second floor smoking a cigarette and he said well if you're interested we've got an offer we have an offer and i didn't know much about it other than to say all right i've been told that i should probably be interested so i'll actually set a contract to them with the purchase price blank in my name talk about crazy <laughs> city never knew about this and i said we'll just match whatever you have because he wouldn't tell me and so long story short they were going to vote right then and Betty told me the story later that she called you. Because Betty, I said, Betty, if we're interested in this, now is the time. We've got to stop this. And so she called you. And I go, I'll call Bill. I'll call my friend Bill. And he's a mason. And she didn't know your you know, degrees. Uh, and somehow, magically, Judge, uh, I use the term Masonic injunction, but <laughs> everything stopped because of you. That's why we have the, that's why we have the Jackson Center. Yeah. Do you remember any much about that at all? You, no, I don't. Yeah. Well, you, you're given all the credit <coughs> by Betty Lynette. Yeah, Betty was a wonderful person. Yeah. And Carl Kappa, they really were the ones that put the money up. Well, but they also, the deal. Yeah. The deal, and I applaud you because not only the, the injunction, but the deal with the Masons was contingent yeah. on a lease. That's right. On a lease, and you helped yeah. negotiate that because that was a, a little bit of give and take. Lucian was involved. I got everybody in the game. Uh, and so, but ultimately, the deal that made it was to have you specifically be on our board of directors, which we were glad to have. But they wanted a member of the Masons to make sure we didn't go crazy get out of control. So you not only made it happen on the front end, but you also made it happen on the back end. Yeah. And in the meantime, we're able to negotiate this lease, which has all worked out really well. So uh, kudos to you. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, Judge. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You've been wonderful. Thank you for letting me come. You're wired, so you can't leave yet. Yeah, hold on. I'll, uh, cause I, 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 